insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights and Entertainment. This is episode 78 journey into adulthood. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my patient and articulate co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, sweetheart? Tired. How are you? You. It <laughs> seems to be a recurring theme in these podcasts these days. I'm just always tired. We, we do try to pick a decent time to do it. And, no, you know, no, We, we seem true. to do it after a meal, and that's always... Uh, right, and that's the problem. We need to do mistake. it before the meal because, you know, the whole digestion and just exactly. wanting a nap, you know. Exactly. But that's okay. we got to work on that. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, in our Disney Detective segment today, we will be talking about the possibility of redoing Imagination, a Journey into Imagination with Figment. No comment there? <laughs> no, I, okay. I figured I'd, you know, I'd wait. <laughs> uh, then we'll be talking about Disney Plus won't always be a family-friendly network. We're going to get some... Not adult oriented content, but <laughs> not, not that kind of adult oriented <laughs> content, but not just children's correct kind of content, uh, which we kind of knew they were going to have to branch out mm -hmm. sooner or later. Uh, then we have 12 fascinating things to talk about inside Disney's secret vault. Uh, is one of those by chance uh, Walt Disney's head in formaldehyde or frozen or something like that? No, his Christmas list. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, that's, that's, I guess that's good enough. Sure, sure. Uh, in our Tales from the Galaxy's Edge, we'll be talking about George Lucas's reaction to uh, The Mandalorian, mm -hmm. uh, which I actually had seen this article myself, too. So it's an interesting story. Mm -hmm. In our entertainment news, we will be looking at uh, NBC's efforts to revitalize Broadway with a primetime special. Um, I'm not sure why it's just NBC, but... Maybe we'll get into that. Uh, Netflix just dropped a teaser trailer for uh, the next season of The Crown. Um, and we'll get our first glimpse at uh, who Princess Diana is going to be. Mm -hmm. So sounds up uh, like an interesting story. And then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Mm-hmm. Uh, before we do get started uh, into that, I uh, did want to invite everyone to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast software or we're available on apple podcast spotify google stitcher amazon iHeartRadio, and so forth um, i would also encourage folks to reach out to us and give us your feedback let us know what you like what you don't like what you'd like to see changed you can email us at comments at insights into things .com. you can hit us on twitter at insights underscore things um or you can hit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast. Uh, you can also catch us streaming six days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. Or you can get our high res videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. Or you can get links to all those things on our website at insights into things.com. Now, are we ready to get into it? Sure. Okay. Are you sure you're awake? Because, you know, I'm questioning that at this point. <laughs> I am awake. Thank oh. you. All right. So let's get into it. Go for Disney Detective. So obviously during this time, um, you know, that we're in right now, um, a lot of things that were supposed to be under construction and, and being reimagined at Disney 
uh, a lot of the things they've actually kind of put on hold. And we even talked about that a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, that the the new phases of different things has kind of been been stopped for now. Um, but one of the things that was kind of interesting was that there was a event that was uh, tea at USC that they had the other night. And Tony Baxter, who is um, a retired Imagineer, um, you know, kind of brought up the idea that, you know, he wouldn't mind helping to refresh uh, Journey into Imagination. Uh, he said, I just wish, you know, we could do uh, a ride. Uh, we could do the ride over. I would come back out of retirement to actually help with that. Um, now, if you don't know, Tony Baxter actually recently came out of retirement to some sort of extent uh, to help work on another project. And that's the reimagining of Splash Mountain into Princess and the Frog themed attraction. Baxter will actually uh, be... Um, he will be the creative advisor on the retheming after he actually worked on the original Splash Mountain. Uh, his work on Splash Mountain to completely remove the intellectual property would presumably obviously be different than working on Journey into Imagination. So, you know, again, th when they talked about all of the different things that they were changing with Epcot and, you know, the different rides that were coming in, the different changes, Journey to Imagination was one of those ones that they just kind of left alone. But a lot of fans would enjoy that, you know, kind of being reimagined more like the original version was. So, you know, it was interesting to, to hear, you know, not only do the Disney fans want it, but even some of the Imagineers as well would be interested in in doing that so well i know disney fans can be pretty fickle when people come in and, and <laughs> change their rides mess with their rides yeah um uh so has there been any pushback has has there been any any community feedback as to people who are against this type of thing no i think for the most part while the the newer version of journey into imagination isn't hated it's not oh i won't go on that ride because of it it's just not the same for people that are rid that remember the original version of the ride so you know it's more of a it would be nice to kind of bring it back to you know what it was so would the retheming be more a blend of present and past or more of a probably to the past? i think probably you know bring back dream finder um you know because at one point figment when they redid the ride figment wasn't even part of the ride and he was the whole reason for you know the journey into imagination because he was a figment of your imagination so i think you know people would kind of like to have that brought back so interesting yeah hmm. so It'd, it'd be nice. I mean, I've never saw the original version right. of it, so. Maybe that'll be something, wink, wink, that we talk about on our upcoming possible podcast. That Possibly. That was is in the work. a very awkward tease there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving right along. Uh, so what do we have next? So Disney Plus is obviously reporting that, you know, they're not going to be so family friendly oriented going in the future, which we kind of already knew. Um, so it seems that an industry insider um, who hosts a uh, behind the trailer YouTube series recently took to trailer, uh, sorry, recently took to Twitter with a sizzling rumor about the streaming service Disney Plus that they'll be adding some grown up only sections in which we'll be able to put more of the adult content and not that kind of adult content. Um, obviously, if you, you know, were watching the news, Disney um, last year bought uh, 20th Century Fox, which is now known as 20th Century Studio. And obviously, they have that whole library of movies and shows that they uh, that they fall under. Um, so basically the rumor or you know what they're saying is that they're hearing that Disney Plus is definitely creating an adult section for the Fox and Touchstone uh content and that you'll need a pin 
uh, a pin code or something like that to be able to unlock the parental control. So you won't just be able to get into it so that this way, you know, for, you know, these R-rated movies that you don't want your kids watching, there'll be some, you know, parental controls um, on that. So expanding, you know, this, you know, and, and the whole library of everything could, you know, bring the, the viewership to Disney Plus, you know, to almost what they were hoping, um, you know, to match Netflix. Um, because right now, you know, they have, you know, s- most of their movies are PG or PG-13, nothing above that. But there's obviously all these other movies that were under um, the Touchstone brand, which was a brand that they created in 1984 to kind of separate you know, the Disney family type movies, um, you know, and actually Who Framed Roger Rabbit actually came under Touchstone. Um, But then you also have, you know, classics like Pretty Woman, Dead Poet Society, Good Morning Vietnam. And, you know, so it would be nice to kind of add that to their library of of offerings on Disney+. Plus. Um, You know, if you look, um, you know, they've been adding... um, a few things, you know, here and there, it would be nice to kind of add, you know, a bunch more, uh, you know, to offer things again, not just for the families to watch, but just for, you know, the adults to, to watch, you know, as well. So now is this something that if you're a Disney Plus subscriber already, you'll just get by default, mm-hmm. or is this yeah. an opt-in type? No, thing? it didn't talk about anything as being an additional fee, or you know, it's just we're extending, you know, we're adding to what you know we were already offering to you. So you're just going to get more content that's going to mm-hmm. have parental controls. Mm-hmm. On. The reason I ask is with the release of Mulan and the idea of right. paying. $30 to get access to this movie and it's yours as long as you keep your mm-hmm. subscription. Right. I, my first concern is that Disney's now going to nickel and dime me to death with every little thing here. And if you want, oh, you want to have, you know, Touchstone and these other ones, it's going to be another dollar a month or $2 right. a month or something like that. As long as they stay away from that, I think they'll be safe. Yeah. As of right now, there hasn't been anything. Now, again, this is all, you know, rumors too like nothing official nothing with a date as to when it would become available has has now, been mentioned they have, so uh, a library listed of what they expect to have available there or they're just speculating at this no point? they're just speculating it, you know the article basically talks about you know here are the different films that have fallen under you know touchstone um hollywood uh pictures was you know at once one point in time owned by Disney as well. So it kind of just, you know, listed, Hey, these are movies that could come to fruition. Okay. So tell us about the 12 fascinating things in Disney's secret vault. So if you didn't know that there is actually, um, a whole department, um, of Disney where they, uh, it is part of the Walt Disney Archive. Um, if you actually watched one of the Disney Plus shows, Prop Culture, which was one of our, our favorite shows that we watched, we actually got to see a little bit of a behind-the-scenes view of this fascinating area. Um, so the home base for the Walt Disney Archive is actually Burbank, California, La- Uh, Burbank, California at the Walt Disney Studio lot. And then there's also some secret warehouses scattered uh, throughout Southern California. Uh, What's interesting is this, these archives hold things that fall under almost all of their brands between, you know, television shows, ESPN, uh, Marvel, uh, Lucas, Pixar, 20th Century Fox, um, basically everything that falls under the umbrella um, of, of Disney at this time. Uh, so it was actually founded in 1970, which was four years after Walt Disney's death, and the archives actually just celebrated its 50th anniversary. It was the brainchild of Walt's brother, Roy, uh, who took over as CEO after Walt died. He was approached by 
a librarian at UCLA, who was Dave Smith, uh, who was looking to put together a biography of books that were written about Disney up until that point. Uh, Walt Disney's office had been closed up since he had passed away in 1966, and they hadn't really done anything with any of the materials or the furnishings from the office. So in 1969, Roy had hired Dave to spend a year basically inventorying everything in Walt's office. And that's where he got the idea that they should probably put together something for the company's history. So many people at that time were retiring or passing away, um, and they were losing all of this important history. So the archives actually started with just one person in an office uh, in the old animation building, and now has grown to a staff of 30. They do exhibitions, um, they engage in fam support at the official uh, Disney Fan Club D23 events, and, um, you know, and basically are the the keepers of all of these, you know, awesome items um, that you know, most people don't even know still exist. Um, you know, so when they asked, you know, how many items do you have? And, you know, the the short answer is, you know, millions. You know, they have 25 million photos, thousands and thousands of costumes and props, hundreds of ride vehicles and real vehicles, huge boxes of merchandise, all kinds of files from all over the company, um, basically every video that's ever been produced, uh, every DVD, and every book, you know, so basically if there's something about Disney that's been around or to do with the parks, they have, you know, something to do with it. Um, so what's kind of interesting is when you go through this article, they, they show pictures. Um, the Walt Disney Archives actually has a an Instagram page as well, and every now and they'll, uh, they'll throw up uh, pictures of, you know, different things that they have. Um, so one of the things is if you've ever been on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, they have the redheaded pirate um, because when they redid the ride a couple of years ago, they changed out the audio animatronic uh, version of the, the redhead. She's there. Um, one of the movie props that they have is the snow globe from Mary Poppins. And what was funny was when they were done shooting the scene, they actually were just going to throw it out. And somebody went and picked it out from the garbage and wanted to hold on to it. And years later, when they created the archive, the person, you know, gave it to the archive so that they could, you know, hold on to it, where now it would be something that they would hold on to, you know. And, and that was the thing, too, is so much artwork back in the day, once they were done shooting films, was just thrown away, where now, obviously, everything's done digitally, um, but now they, they've been taking the time to preserve so much more you know, of the history. Uh, they're not so quick to just, you know, throw things away or they try and reuse them, you know, obviously if they can, um, you know, so they had, um, you know, season old, uh, seasonal props from the different parades that they did, you know, at Disneyland. Um, they have, um, you know, toy soldier costumes, you know, from when, uh, the Walt Disney parade, uh, debuted the parade of toys, um, you know, again, different costumes, uh, Walt's Christmas list that he had, had written, um, you know, so again, just some very interesting things. Um, you know, one of the things is, um, Heimlich, um, his choo-choo train, which was an attraction at, um, California Adventure. The ride actually closed in 2018 to make way for the Adventures uh, Avengers Campus. So the the ride vehicle is in the archives now because they didn't know what to do with it. So again, just so many interesting things, and you know things you know recent items and things from you know years ago as well. So if you're interested in you know diving into what's in the archive, you know, uh, a good show to watch is either, you know, prop culture, um, or, you know, follow, uh, the, the Disney archives on, on Instagram to, to get an inside peek of things. So besides prop culture and the occasional D 23, um, 
traveling exposition mm-hmm. that they do. Right. Where they'll pull things from the archive mm-hmm. and bring them out on display. Are there any plans of doing a traveling exhibit or opening it up as a museum or anything like that? No, they they usually don't, you know, because as you've seen on, you know, when we watch the show, so many of the things are, are considered uh, museum quality. You know, you have to wear gloves to 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 look at it. Right. Now, I know every now and then different exhibits pop up, you know, across the, the country you know, featuring different things, you know, you'll hear about, you know, this thing at Disney and this thing. Cause I think, um, I don't know if it's, it was going on now, but I know, uh, the Disney family museum was running a special exhibit. Um, and I think, you know, probably part of the, you know, items that they had were probably, you know, donated or on, um, loan, on from, loan, you know, and from that's the Disney Family Museum in San Francisco. Right, right. So, you know, the I know I went to, but you didn't go to. Well, you didn't actually even go into I it. I was in it. I just didn't walk through <laughs> you it. You didn't pay to walk through. <laughs> <laughs> you made it in the lobby. <laughs> but yeah, you know, like at, at this point, you know, right now, I don't know if there's any plans to to do anything. That'd be kind of neat. Like, mm-hmm. and that's what I like about prop culture is it mm-hmm. goes through and it shows you some of that behind the scenes right. magic and where the journey of of some of these pieces mm-hmm. after the movie and the fact that some of these things, you know, especially the very early movies, right, where you didn't see these things, right. You know, the, you just the got carpet rid of it. bag from right. uh, Mary Poppins. Yeah, it was given away as, as uh, um, the, you know, they had a, a sweepstakes. Right. And it was filled with money. And the person that won it was just like, well, I just want the money. And, and the they, marketing person kept the bag and, and it um, made its way back into the archive, right. which I think is just an amazing mm-hmm. story. Yeah, yeah. And so many pieces that are show up in the show and, and probably – Thousands more like that in mm-hmm. the archive have those kinds of amazing yeah. stories. Yeah, that they basically found their way back. You know, the snow globe, you know, yeah. it ended up in the trash. And someone's like, oh, that's kind of cool. I'll keep it. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So uh, I think that was all we had for Disney Detective. Mm-hmm. We'll take a quick break and we'll come back with our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. Right. (laughs) So, if you've been living under a rock since November, (laughs) you didn't know anything about the Mandalorian. (laughs) Then you're a snail. Then you're a snail. frog outside would like you. Right. We We have a pet frog outside, along with other... Things. Anyway, so obviously, as I was saying, November 12th, Disney launched, Disney Plus launched, obviously, a major offering, one of the, um, you know, the first time a live action uh, Star Wars show that basically like blew up, really, um, you know, and and had, you know, one of the most sought after TV characters, you know, as well, uh, you know, on the internet. Um, so executive producers, John Favreau and Dave Filoni, um, uh, are the, I'm sorry, the executive producers of the Mandalorian, which starts Pedro Pascal as the mysterious bounty hunter. Um, and obviously that kind of helped to bring, 
a massive sign up to uh, members for Disney Plus, um, which now has about 60.5 million paid subscribers now, and now has been awarded 15 Emmy nominations, including uh, drama series Nod which is actually very rare for a sci-fi show. Um, so Filoni and um, Favreau actually sat down and kind of, you know, took took some, you know, a break from post- post-production on season two to basically talk about what it was like bringing, you know, keeping the Baby Yoda secret, you know, for so long, and then also what was uh, George Lucas's reaction uh, to the series so far. Um, you know, so Dave Filoni was talking about um, how the first person who really, you know, knew that Baby Yoda or the child was going to be as big of a hit was actually cast member uh, Werner Herzog, um, who actually, you know, said that this is you know, when when acting with it, he said, this is really magical. And we've, you know, there have been many articles that we've talked about before where, you know, he actually talked to the puppet. You know, he felt it was a real, you know, character and everybody else kind of, you know, jo- joined in on it. Um, you know, and they talk about how, um, you know, how keeping it a secret and about the merchandise aspect and, and how much money Disney kind of lost, you know, not doing it. And, you know, John Favreau basically had said, you know, it was important to establish that there were going to be surprises that, you know, they didn't, they wanted to promote the show, but they didn't want to give so much of it away. So that was, you know, they had to make that deal. Listen, we can't do promotional toys beforehand because then people are going to know or, you know, speculate as to what they know. Um, So really when you think about it, you know, it was it was a smart move, of course, for people that wanted a Baby Yoda doll. <laughs> you know, they were kind of left out in the cold up until, you know, a couple of months ago when you could finally, you know, start getting, uh, you know, some of the stuff. Um, you know, and then, you know, in the article, you know, he asks, you know, what was it like, um, you know, with George Lucas and what was his reaction to it? Um, and he said, you know, that... You know, that Dave Filoni says that, you know, he really likes when he talks with, you know, George Lucas because he likes to get knowledge from him, Um, you know, but, you know, that George actually told him, you know, what he really thought of the show and he was being very complimentary and that he enjoys the show and that now he actually gets to watch it as a fan and as a viewer and not have to be, you know, part of it. And, you know, Dave Filoni said, you know, knowing that, you know, that means a lot to to him and John that, you know, they he's basically given them, you know, obviously his approval and doesn't need to change. You know, they don't need to change anything. George ha- is happy with the legacy, um, you know, that that they've uh, done, you know, and, and they talked about, you know, what is it like, you know, what's filming going to be like for the third season with obviously, you know, with COVID-19. Um, and John Favreau says that, you know, fortunately, they can limit the number of people that are on set. Um, also, that um, the way that they do a lot of things is a lot of stuff is done remotely from what they call the brain bar. So there doesn't need to be camera people right on top of everybody. Things can be done from a distance away or they do a lot of things outside, which kind of helps. And, you know, they do a lot of stuff with the VR, which is, you know, one of the things we got to see in action uh, during the documentary uh, on the Mandalorian. So they feel like they should be able to, you know, resume um, uh, production once they've kind of gotten the all, all clear. Plus, a lot of stuff can be done, you know, remotely with the post production, you know, things as well. So hopefully for season three, you know, things won't be, you know, too delayed, you know, with it. So well, that's cool. That's yeah. cool. And, and, you know, we kind of thought that it was going to be something that George liked because it's so reminiscent of mm-hmm. what the early roots of Star Wars was. It's right. character development, it's story development, mm-hmm. and it's that 
back to basics sort of um, practical uh, set design and mm-hmm. the, the actors that they brought in. They didn't bring in all these, you know, well-known, well-known actors. Right. You know, you weren't bringing in, you know, the equivalent of a Harrison Ford today. Right. You know, not that these actors are not quality actors. Right. But you're you're you've got a lot of breakthrough actors mm-hmm. that have an opportunity here. Right. Um, and it's being directed by people who are passionate about mm-hmm. the the genre. It's not just people that are coming in and it's a job to them. Right. You know, Dave Filoni, John Favreau, the all the directors mm-hmm. that they have, they're all passionate about Star Wars. And it comes through in everything that they do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that Lucas probably appreciates more than anything. Is that, you know, he he saw kind of what happened when he sold his soul. I was going to say his soul. (laughs) He sold his soul to Disney. Right. And you had a couple of very questionable movies Mm -hmm. come out of it that were not in line with what Lucas's vision was. Right. And I think he started to wonder if he made a mistake. Right. And seeing how production on this show is going and how well it's doing and how well it's received and the number of awards it's been Mm -hmm. nominated for. Yeah. I think it's giving him a little bit more confidence knowing that his legacy of Star Wars is in the right hands. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was kind of what my takeaway from this was. Yeah. And I agree. Uh, You know, I think it's a it's a fantastic piece of artwork that they do right now mm-hmm. i think they're with the the blend of of practical effects mm-hmm. with new technology you know right. we're not just talking computer generated you know graphics here we're talking about what is the ideal blend of technology mm-hmm. and practical effects i think they've done a fantastic mm-hmm. job with yeah so I'm very excited to see the next season. I'm glad to hear that that Lucas is is happy with what he's seen so mm-hmm. far. So that was all we had for our. Uh, let me scroll up. Hang on, I don't want to scroll it up again. Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. That's too many words. I'm telling you, I can't do that. Anyway, let's take a quick break, and we'll be back with our entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Tell us about revitalizing Broadway. So NBC is planning to launch a primetime Broadway special in October. Um, Page Six has actually reported it. um, And it is, uh, which, you know, they're hoping to have uh, showcase different casts from different Broadway shows. Uh, The network has reached out to all of the Broadway shows and asked uh, you know, f- was trying to find out who wa- was able to participate. Um, so theater insiders tell us that now there's actually some drama going on as producers are scrambling to participate um, to be able to get ready for all of this. Um, a couple of showbiz insiders had said that producers uh, have been hurt by the shutdown and they don't want to spend a, lo- a lot of money to do this. And that some casts are actually worried that because they haven't performed in six months, that they would need to have rehearsal time, costumes fitted because they might have put on a little bit of weight, um, and that they would want to get paid 
um, a week's salary to participate in this. Um, also, you know, somebody else, uh, another source had said that, you know, there's definitely challenges. A number of shows have confirmed, but then some shows are really frustrated that it just can't work for them um, because of the show's um, production budget. Um, you know, they can't fly cast members back because after things shut down, some cast members, you know, flew you know, other places, they're not readily available, um, you know, and other shows, you know, so you only have, you know, some members of the cast. So how do you, you know, do it without the rest of them? Um, you know, so there's a lot going on, you know, to, to make this happen really within, you know, a, a little over a month. Um, you know, some shows were, were thinking that maybe they would just feature um, soloists, you know, from the show and maybe not the whole cast. But again, you know, there there's so much up in the air to, to try and make this happen again, you know, within a, a month. Um, and obviously, while everything is, is shut down. Um, so obviously, with everything that happened and all the things that shut down, Broadway was one of the big things that was affected. Um, they were far, forced to shut down in March. And as of right now, there's no plans to open back up until January of, of next year. Um, so hopefully this will kind of help to to bring some people back to work, you know, in some way, shape or form. Uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Re Webber actually recently experimented at his uh, London Palladium value uh, venue with a show um, of how, you know, how you can still do a live performance, you know, safely in the COVID um, error. So maybe, you know, more and more places will start, you know, doing certain things to kind of bring back, you know, the live theater, because we know that's, you know, one of the areas that's, you know, hit not just for Broadway, but even all the local theaters, you know, that would do productions and, and stuff like that. So I have to imagine that some of these shows just don't adapt well to being filmed. Right. Um, I mean, like Hamilton was fantastic mm -hmm. when it was done, but it was done with multi cameras. It was done over multiple days of production. Right. It was done right. with and without audiences. So right. there was a lot of effort that went into mm -hmm. it. With the intent of publishing it on right of of to be know, a, a streaming movie. format, mm -hmm. so I have to I have to assume that a lot of especially with some of the more complex set designs and stuff like right. that, just would not translate well. Plus the logistics, like you had mentioned, mm -hmm. of just getting your cast back if right. they don't live in the area, right? And are you quarantining your your cast, you know, for two weeks? beforehand to even be able to do anything now granted you have to figure when they put on you know the tony awards you know a big part of the tony awards is seeing little snippets um you know from from various shows so they could kind of do something like that yeah. you know if they needed to be but again you know it's getting the cast there you know who's been quarantined who hasn't um you know the costumes again you know it's not a quick easy oh let me just put this on it's been six months yeah, and i think know? we've all put a little pound a few <laughs> pounds on in the last six months yeah yeah so i can only imagine you know for for people like that you know maybe it's you know you kind of you know as much as it would you know, kind of suck to do it as a Zoom call, you know, maybe you do what the, you know, what Disney did, the different sing-alongs, uh, the, the episodes that, that and Disney if, did. And that's the thing, like, if the whole purpose of this is to keep people interested in mm -hmm. Broadway and getting them coming back when it restarts, the, the sing-along thing would probably mm -hmm. be perfect for something right. like that, because that's something that you could produce mm -hmm. very inexpensively. Mm -hmm. um, and I give... NBC props for mm -hmm. what they're trying to do here. I yeah. think what they're trying to do is the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel for the shows that just cannot translate to this type of environment. Right. And, you know, we've already heard, you know, Disney's Frozen, you know, isn't going to be coming back to Broadway. And I'm sure they're not the only show at this point that has made that decision. But, like, I could see you doing a variety show where mm -hmm. you're showing snippets of musical numbers mm -hmm. from very various ones because yeah. you might not be able to put your entire stage right. performance on for the cameras mm -hmm. but there may be two or three numbers from your show that you can do just to keep 
that right that and it doesn't there, have you know? to be obviously all of the musicals either you know put on a, a short scene from you know some of the the dramas as well where you know with that do you even need to have a full scene you yeah. you know you uh, a full setup you probably just need you know three or four people performing it you know well and i think the one thing that that this effort highlights is the need to help support your arts Absolutely. during this time when you cannot have those audiences mm-hmm. come out for, for the support. We need to find ways to keep this art alive mm-hmm. and going because these are these are areas as well as other businesses that are being oh, seriously absolutely. hit by COVID-19. Um, we, we need to find ways to make mm-hmm. it work. You know, from restaurants that are dining outside on their mm-hmm. tents you know, maybe Broadway has to have shows under tents. Maybe mm-hmm. you need to have a public venue to put on your shows or something like that. I don't know. Right. And and that's something we're starting to see, especially in, in our area. They're doing live concerts outside, live comedy shows where it's a drive-in. You have to stay in your car or if you have, you know, a pickup truck or something, you're allowed, you know, to sit out in... Uh, you know, chairs near your car and basically everything is broadcasted through your radio and that when the show is over, everybody hunks their horn and and flashes their light as a sign of applause. Uh, They've had a couple of comedy shows in our area. They've had a couple of concerts as well. And and from what I've heard, they've gone over really well. You pay one price for, you know, a car load. I think it's, you know, around here it's four people, you know, per car load. Um, They even have um, an app where if you want food, you just order it on the app and somebody comes to your car, you know, and gives it to you. I even heard that the restrooms that they have were very well maintained. Basically, as soon as somebody comes out, somebody goes in and and sprays it down. Um, And if you can do that, why not put on, you know, a a production? You know, they they do the plays in the park, you know, anyway, here's an opportunity to, to do that. Um, you know, with with a with a, a play with a Broadway show, and that, that might be an alternative. But kudos to NBC for mm-hmm. for putting the effort out to try and keep this going for everyone. And that's, yeah. I think if anything, we need to we need to recognize that and mm-hmm. encourage more of that. Yeah, yeah. So what else do we have? So Netflix actually dropped a teaser trailer for the new season of The Crown. Um, And now we get our first first glimpse of Princess Diana. So the moment that we've all been waiting for, um, the fourth season of The Crown, which will actually be debuting on Netflix on November 15th. Um, So obviously not much has come out, but again, we get to see our first look at Princess Diana and Margaret Thatcher as well. Um, So something of import as important as the monarchy simply cannot be allowed to fail, which Olivia Coleman says uh, at the top of the trailer, as we get to see the first shots of her with Margaret Thatcher, who is being played by Gillian Anderson. Um, Then we also get to see Emma Corrin as Princess Diana. So in the short clip, we get to see Diana battling with the sudden press attention after meeting Charles. Then, of course, we get to see some of Diana's iconic and memorable outfits, which actually leads to the trailer's climax, the wedding dress. Um, so season four, we'll see the return, obviously, of the rest of the cast. Uh, Olivia Coleman as Queen Elizabeth, Tobias Mendez as Prince Charles, and Hella, Helena Bottom Carner as Princess Margaret. So this is one of our m- more favorite uh, shows that we, we watch together. And, you know, just when you think it can't get better, they, you know... The next season comes out and, you know, it, and it brings you even more. And it's kind of interesting because now we're getting to the timeline of stuff that I know of, you yeah, know, that, that, that we've lived through. That's you know? the interesting thing is it's it's less of a history lesson now right. and more of a recap of the things that we knew, but we knew from the perspective of seeing it in the headlines. Right, right. Uh, so 
there was a lot of speculation about what mm-hmm. happened in the 80s and 90s. And, right. you know, the show has been a fantastic source of information mm-hmm. for some of the behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. So it's kind of exciting to see where they're mm-hmm. going to go with this. And the fact that they, they managed to get another season out of here because yeah. there's so much story to tell. And, and that's the other thing. There was only supposed to be five seasons. And now they realized, you know, as you said, there's so much more to tell that they don't want to rush through season five. So we get a season six as well. Nice. Nice. Well, that was all we had for entertainment news this week. We'll mm-hmm. be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick is a documentary. You're brushing off on me is really you're, what it you're is. You're working my side of the street here, lady. <laughs> Well, I was surprised you didn't you didn't do this one. Um, so this was actually a documentary that we we ended up watching uh, together, and it is called Howard. Um, it is a 2018 documentary uh, which was written and directed by Don Hahn about the life of songwriter uh, Howard Ashman. So it's the untold story of Howard Ashman, um, who is the brilliant lyricist behind Disney classics uh, such as Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, The Little Mermaid, and also created uh, musicals like uh, Little Shop of Horrors. Unfortunately, um, his life was cut short due to um, uh, developing AIDS in the 80s um and he was only 39 when he when he passed away um the documentary you know gave so much more you know i knew he was established with disney and i knew he had done little shops of horrors but i didn't know a lot of his his earlier background you know so he had gone um you know to college and then ended up in new york he started um a little off-broadway uh production company um where they put on you know all these little uh little shows and that they never really wanted to get big um because that was part of their attraction was was being this small intimate group and that you know little shop of horrors kind of brought him to, you know, the forefront of things. And what was interesting was that he ended up, um, he was working with uh, Marvin Hamlish, and they were supposed to be producing this big uh, Broadway show, Smile, and it actually never came to be. And he thought, oh, that's it, my career is done. And Disney kind of came in and was like, hey, we're looking for somebody to to write some songs for some upcoming, you know, shows and his career kind of, you know, took off. And unfortunately, not much longer after that was when he found out he had AIDS. He kept it hidden for so long and unfortunately passed away before um, Beauty and the Beast even came out. Um, And what was, was so fun to see was to see the behind the scenes um, of them uh, filming songs from Beauty and the Beast. And you got to see Angela Lansbury and scenes uh, from The Little Mermaid with Jodie Benson and, you know, and hear his renditions of the songs, like his, um, you know, his, his, I don't know what they, what the, the correct terminology is, you know, but, you know, his demos of everything and, and, you know, and just the way the word just kind of rolled off. Like he, he was never a performer. He, but he just had a way with, with words really. Um, and you know, it, it's such a, a heartwarming, um, you know, documentary and, and sad, obviously, um, you know, cause you can't imagine what Disney would be like without him. He, you know, was part of that, you know, renaissance, as we, you know, we talked about of Disney animation, um, where, you know, Disney animation had always been going on, but for a while was was kind of bad. And then all of a sudden you had this resurgence and a lot of it had to do with the songs, um, you know, and he he was part of it, you know, so uh, really, really interesting, um, you know, if you 
are interested in, in Disney and Disney background and Disney history or musicals, um, you know, to, to hear about, you know, somebody that you, you might know about and, you know, again, might not know, you know, too much about. So. All right. Good pick. Thank you. So my pick this week uh, should come as no surprise is a documentary. Um, my pick is The King's Highway, which was a uh, crowdfunded documentary that was actually done in our relative neck of the woods here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the King's Highway is a 2016 documentary film about the untold story of Northeast Philadelphia's impact on America and the historical significance of this region. The historic buildings and structures along with along the King's Highway uh, with the, let me start that one again. The historic buildings and structures along the King's Highway along with the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route are the foundation of the film. Augmenting that with in-depth historical coverage of Philadelphia's three defining creeks and rivers, will allow for a very comprehensive depiction. Our expert speakers and documentary filmmaker Jason Sherman will provide the narrative. Archival footage, documents, photographs, and artifacts give you a glimpse into the past. Time-lapse aerial and walkthrough fo uh, footage of many locations enables you to see the beauty that has been all but forgotten. The goal of the film is to not only spread awareness about the historic value of this area, but to also showcase the historians and preservationists that are fighting to keep our beautiful city and the history of the United States of America intact. Um, the King's Highway was a, was a road that ran from New England down towards the southern colonies, and it was the prime route that um, everyone during colonial times used. And... Mm -hmm. It's, it was sort of the Route 66 of colonial times. There was, you know, it was built using old um, Native American path, footpaths. Mm -hmm. And they were eventually built out into um, wagonways and, and you were able to pass carriages through and, okay. and the armies passed up and down it. But the interesting thing, which this film highlights, is... And it only highlights a small piece of it in Northeast Philadelphia is the the cities and the boroughs and the population that grew up okay. along the King's Highway here. And some of the history. One of the things that they focus on in the film is the number of historic buildings that are 200 some years old okay. that are being sacrificed due to progress. Mm, okay. Buildings that are being knocked down and and... Their history is being lost. Um, locations, you know, that we we look at the literally the oldest bridge in the United States is a bridge that was built back in the 1700s, and it's right here in our backyard. Oh, Most wow. people don't know about that. Um, it it was a it was a documentary that hit home with me because one of the things that I'm passionate about is history. Um, and in fact, we're in the process of developing a new history centric podcast that it in itself is designed to highlight the, this very type of thing. The, the pieces of our history that don't get all of the glamour and the highlights that a lot of the more famous things get, but they're equally as important to our history. So this one kind of hit home for me. And the efforts that were being made here and the people that they talked to, all local historians and members of historical societies, you could feel the passion. You could feel the desire to save these things. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple incidents in the film where buildings are lost and no one knew what those buildings were mm, until okay. they were lost. You had a building where... The Continental Congress met at. Okay. And sheltered there. You had buildings that were meeting places for the founding fathers. And they were knocked down to put drugstores in and, and okay. pointless buildings like that mm. that, you know, 
given the amount of space that we have around, I have to think that there were better alternatives. So if nothing else, it's worth watching this to, to gain that appreciation. And again, this is really centra- centralized to Northeast Philadelphia, but the plight of these historic buildings is, is across the country. You know, if we don't preserve these historical places and these self-contained historical monuments, then that history is lost and that part of America is lost. Um, There's a lack of funding. There's a lack of interest. There's a lack of concern. The processes for getting things declared, uh, historic landmarks, are difficult to navigate. They're confusing. They require ridiculous Uh, amounts of supporting evidence where you have to justify why this building that's 200 years old should be preserved. You know, the fact that it's 200 years old is, is justification enough for it to be preserved. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and really we need to, we need to appreciate these things. And that's one thing that I take away from this particular documentary is that need to do that and to get that message out to people and to educate people on them. So, The King's Highway, uh, streaming now on Amazon Prime, and we'll be right back. So, I think that's all we had this week. Yep. Uh, Another good show. Before we go, I do want to invite folks to check out our long-form articles on Medium at medium.com slash insights into things. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast catcher. And don't forget to shoot us an email. Let us know how we're doing and and what you'd like to see us talk about here um, at comments at insightsintothings.com. In addition to our insights into history that we're currently in the process of doing research and development on, we also have another podcast we're working on that we hope to have out shortly. Tell us about that one. And that one is going to be more Disney-centric. Um, obviously we, we feature a lot of Disney and, uh, Disney stuff here, but this is going to be kind of a, um, missing the magic. So, so to speak of, um, things that aren't there anymore. Um, things that are there that, you know, the average person might not know about some kind of insider tips. Um, you know, maybe, a a, 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 a hidden gem of a place to eat or a place to relax. Um, and this is kind of a collaborative effort, um, between you, myself and our daughter, Madison. She's going to be, um, you know, helping to do, uh, research as well. Uh, the, the idea is it'll be kind of a monthly, uh, a podcast that we'll do. Um, we probably won't do it live, um, and try and dig up some, you know, archival photos and videos to kind of help, you know, tell you a story that you might not know, you know, and draw on the 20 plus trips I've had and the Lord knows how many 50 you've something had, I've uh, had down and... there. Cause every time we get, now I've been down there 20 sometimes now, right? Every time I'm down there, there's always something new to find. Mm-hmm. And if, you know, for most people, going to Disney is a once-in-a-lifetime activity. Right, right. And if you just go once, you'll have a fantastic time, but you'll miss so much. Right. Because you just don't have the time. Right. You you re- literally need probably like a couple of months. Right. At one. You need to be a member of the NBA in order to really appreciate <laughs> And even Disney. then, you can't because, you know, you're stuck in your hotel room, you know, yeah. until the end of the day. So um, so hopefully the, the new podcast will, will allow us to mm-hmm. educate folks and show them a little bit of behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. And uh, a shout out to any of our new subscribers who found us through Instagram. Uh, we're now on Instagram, Insights Into Things uh, podcast, and we kind of... Uh, followed some other uh, podcasts, some other creators, and some other creators started following us and were going to give us a listen. So shout out to to all of our, our new listeners who found us uh, through Instagram. And you know what? Give us a drop us a, an email and we'll be happy to plug your podcast. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. I think that's it. Another one in the books. All right. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye. Oh, 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 oh,